Okay, folks. Um, good morning. Um, who was at the dancing last night? <laughs> How do you feel? Fitter than when you started, or less fit, or did it test your fitness? Um, we would, uh, from UWS, would just like to thank you for uh, yesterday evening. Um, there's nothing that we Scottish people like than uh, more than a good Kayleigh. Um, it's, it's the way that we would dance at weddings and celebrations. Um, and uh, it was great that all our colleagues um, were game, as they say, were up for, for learning the different dances. Um, I think it'll make a hilarious uh, DVD. <laughs> I don't know, is that old-fashioned DVDs now? Is that, that, that me showing my age? YouTube, YouTube, is that what I'm supposed to say? Is it, uh, you, you, you'll see we're a very, well, I'm a very digitally aware member of the UWS staff. Um, so again, just some housekeeping issues. Um, no fire alarms. Uh, again, evacuate the building. Remind you that if you need access to a computer, the computers in the McLean corridor have been unlocked. Um, a reminder as well that after the closing ceremony, there is a bagged lunch available for you. So if you're traveling immediately after this or you're going somewhere else, if you're going to see some uh, tourist sites, etc., there'll be a bagged lunch um, uh, for you uh, after the closing ceremony. Can I encourage you to come back to the closing ceremony because we will be presenting the award for the poster prizes. We also hope to uh, show you uh, a small documentary, short documentary. Documentary is maybe a bit grand. Um, but it's a snapshot of people's experiences over the three days of the conference. So you'll maybe get a bit of a laugh um, as well. Now, um, we're moving, sorry, I've also got to tell you that, that uh, throughout this morning, a survey monkey um, a survey tool will drop into your inboxes just to, to again gather some uh, reflections on the conference. What did you like? What could we have done differently? Um, uh, what would you have liked to have seen that perhaps wasn't um, uh, there. So that will drop in and if I can encourage you, as many of you to complete that as possible. It doesn't need to be done today but over the next few days if you could complete that for us. Now, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Stuart McCabe. Um, Stuart is, is one of our students. I should actually say Stuart is one of our stars. Um, he's a non, coming from a student from a non-mainstream background um, but that doesn't and hasn't and will never stop him. He's the one student, or one of the many students actually, that you can go to um, with an issue. You can ask him for help. Um, he's been around, you've probably seen him around the past uh, three days. Um, he is in fact one of our go-to students. He is highly dedicated uh, to UWS and, and I hope he feels us uh, to him as well. He studied for his honours degree here and is now studying for his master's degree in web development. Um, he is, sadly, um, a St Mirren supporter, um, which, which is the local football team for, for those that are not that well informed. Um, uh, they do, I think I'd be generous to if I said they do okay. Oh, there's some booze in the audience there. <laughs> They're not as good as Cumnock Juniors. Um, so in, in, in that sense, um, uh, we learn a lot from, from Stuart, um, and I hope Stuart learns a lot from you. And Stuart's going to talk for a few moments about his experience at UWS. He just felt that it flowed nicely into the theme for the conference. And then he'll introduce uh, Professor Craig Mahoney, our Principal and Vice-Chancellor, who's the final co keynote uh, speaker for uh, the conference. Stuart, thanks very much. Well, I just want to say um, thank you for allowing me along to speak. Um, well, I've been a student at UWS since about 2007. Um, as Paul mentioned, I've done an honours degree in IT. Uh, now, when I walked through the door in 2007, I thought, Oh, what am I coming into? Because I, I went to college before that down the road at uh, West College. Um, so it was pretty nerve-wracking coming into such a, a big institution. But I soon quickly realised that UWS is a, a very unique institution from uh, other institutions. Um, it allows students to give them a chance, give them, a, give them an opportunity, put an arm around them and say, 
right, here you go, here's a platform. Uh, do what you can do, because there's so many variety of different students in this university that do a heck of a lot of work, uh, a heck of a lot of hard work to get to get an honours degree or even a, an ordinary degree, because um, if you go to a, a, a um, there's a chance that other universities m might not take students. So this university provides a platform for them to come in and meet, meet new people, learn new skills. And that's what it's done for me, because <coughs> I didn't go to a, 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 I went to a non-mainstream school, which meant that obviously I wasn't segregated from um, like you would do in a mainstream education. So there was a lot of opportunities that I kind of missed out on. But through coming to UWS, I've had um, work opportunities. Uh, through doing the masters, I've learned how to do website development. Uh, I've learned how to do design databases, things like that. Things I never even thought I could even do before I even walked through the door. So uh, um, I think what this conference has taught me is the fact that what meeting all these different people from different countries, uh, nations, is that everybody can achieve something if they put their mind to it. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Craig. Um, Professor Craig Mahoney has been a principal and vice chancellor U of UWS since August 2013. I got a graduate in chemistry and education from the University of Tans Tasmania. He has traveled to Paisley via Birmingham where he achieved his master's degree in Queen's, at Queen's University of Belfast, where he gained his PhD. With 25 years' experience, he, has chartered, he is a chartered psychologist. Craig is a board member of the Sports Scotland and the Quality Assurance and Glasgow Set of Science, and is a trustee of the uh, Craig and Trust for the University of Scotland. So I'd like you to give you a warm welcome to Professor Craig Mahoney, who will finally present the final keynote speech of this conference. Thanks, Stuart. Do you want to move off the stage? I think the guys are going to help you. Well, for those of you that were out last night, thanks very much for getting up and coming in this morning. I hope it's not uh, been too traumatic. The toilets aren't far away if you need them. Um, and uh, hopefully your legs and your uh, arms and lungs are in reasonably working order, order this morning following uh, all the strenuous activity of last evening. Great event. As I said last night, for those of you that weren't there, I, I gave my appreciation to my colleagues in the university, staff and students who have uh, who put this all together for us, planning that's taken more than a year, typical for a conference and one which I think has run exceptionally well, and the feedback I've had so far has been, been brilliant, so uh, uh, no prejudice toward the survey monkey that you do later, but uh, uh, the Likert scale will be one to five. Five is very good. <laughs> <laughs> we like fives. Uh, it was only yesterday when I said to Paul, listen, why don't we get uh, a student to come up and, and do the introduction this morning, and the reason why we did that is because many times in my period of, of tenure here, uh, we've put students up front and centre because we try and say, and if you look at our corporate strategy, the first thing in our corporate strategy around what we're here for is we're here for our students. And so we've, we've often asked students, some of them um, yeah, not so comfortably doing it, but stand up in front of a, an audience first before anybody else from the university, just to reinforce that point that this university is about students. We do other things as well, but we are about students. And so delighted when student, uh, Stuart was asked and uh, he agreed to do that, that he was prepared to stand up and say a few words. Stuart, thanks. Uh, I want to take you on a little journey. I like journeys. Um, my journey's been a long journey uh, over many years. I won't go into the decades, um, but in terms of uh, miles, we're still imperial here, unfortunately, 13,000 miles away from where I was born. And I'm going to ask some questions of you. So there's a few questions up here, which I'm not going to read out, but you can have a look at them. You're going to come back to these questions at the end, and I'm hoping during the course of this, in the same way that... Um, both Lorraine um, and uh, uh, Ruth yesterday posed the opportunity for you to be thinking about your own activity, what you do in education and how what you may hear in a presentation of this sort asks you to do 
or challenge your thinking or challenge your ideas on things. So there's a couple of questions there. They'll be more relevant to some of you than others, but I'm very keen and very comfortable that everybody in a university, staff and students, as well as external people from a university, have a role to play in helping that university develop, whether that's its corporate activity, whether that's its academic portfolio, whether that's its research activity, it doesn't actually mod matter what it is. We all have a vested interest in being involved in those processes. So, uh, my title, which was uh, uh, trying to look forward in the future about higher education, uh, touching on the theme of inclusivity and diversity, something I'm very passionate about, but I'm going to be talking more about the journey for the future. And, and I've talked about this many, many times, and I often feel like it's falling on deaf, deaf ears, but we'll see how, uh, how you respond during this. We are in an undoubtedly extremely rapidly changing world, in my opinion. Uh, in my time on Earth, we've gone from things that are now commonplace and every day that certainly were not even thought of when I was a youngster. And I think that's only going to increase. In fact, I was at a, a presentation by an entrepreneur here in Scotland last year when he said, if you think the pace of change at the moment is rapid, he said the next five or ten years will show to you that back then it was actually easy paced. In other words, it's just going to become more prolific. So lots of things are going on, some of them good, some of them bad. And, and unfortunately, the UK has been uh, in receipt of a, a number of rather tragic stories over the past uh, couple of months, which have you know, really challenged everybody in the UK on, on what life is, how we should live, the things that we can and can't do. Well, higher education is no different. It's changing, and there are many things that we need to think about. Uh, and some of these here are not necessarily the only words we could put here. I think uh, yesterday Lorraine gave a very compelling example of things beyond some of these things that we often talk about the value and purpose of universities for that are not listed there. So it's not an exclusive list, it's just a, it's just a brain dump. So back to my point a moment ago that when I was a kid, you know, I didn't think that I'd ever have a, a telephone in my pocket. You know, I'm standing here now with a smart telephone that's got more intelligence than all of us in this room put together. When I grew up, the telephone was connected to the wall. When we picked up the receiver, there were no dials on it. There was a person on the other end of the line, this is a true story, who said, what number do you want? And where I grew up, numbers were three digits long. I can still remember, our home number was 851. My parents owned a business, the phone number was 932. So you picked up the phone, you said, I want, you know, whatever, 136. Oh, okay, so you want John Smith. So the, <laughs> the person on the other end knew who, <laughs> who you wanted because these numbers came up regularly. Well, could I have ever imagined that I would now be able to have a telephone in my pocket, that I could ring whoever I wanted to whenever I wanted to? Certainly not. So you yeah, look at this list of words here. Yeah, the future is now. It's not tomorrow. It's not what we think about in, in you know, a week or a month's time. It's right here, right now. We are the future and we create the future. We determine the future. And universities are wonderful opportunities for that to happen. Yeah, one of our core purposes has surely got to be thinking about the here and now and what the future will be. And that's why research and enterprise and innovation from that are embedded strongly in the core principles of what universities are about. So I'm going to touch on some of these things as I go through my presentation. I want to talk about seven different points to, to give you some thoughts and to challenge your own thinking about what repositioning higher education might mean. Just as an aside, a little bit of background history, there's 150 universities in the UK. There are a few other higher education institutions. When you take all the numbers together, those who are delivering higher education in the UK, it's probably about 220 organisations are delivering higher education. Now you can compare that to your own uh, national footprint and what happens in that country. So a global outlook. Um, yeah, this, is, this is something I'm fundamentally committed to. Yeah, as an Australian living in the UK, having worked in other countries, I've always been what I would refer to as a global citizen. Didn't start out that way. Some of you heard me last night refer to the fact I grew up on a farm and uh, my world was that farm. That was as far as I looked. I didn't have much knowledge about things. And again, a true story. When I came here in the 80s and, and I was a mature adult, well, no, I was an adult, um, <laughs> I was 30 years of age and I went to Birmingham University and I was given the opportunity within the first month of being there of going on a student exchange trip to what was then Czechoslovakia a socialist country in a part of the world that I'd been grown up, I'd grown up in the belief that this was a bad place, okay? Because my parents went through the Second World War 
when Germany and then subsequently Japan with socialist type regimes in some cases were trying to, it appeared, populate the world with their regime. So my parents grew up, or I grew up in my parents' company with the creation in my mind that socialism was really bad, communism was awful and you should avoid it at all costs. So here was I, at 30, okay, so you know, naive in terms of worldly understanding, offered to go to Czechoslovakia on a student exchange trip and I'm thinking, whoa, geez, do I want to do that? That's a socialist country. I've been taught that that's not a good place to go. Now I went there, fell in love with the country and a person, that's history. <laughs> But I go back there regularly now, and, and I've seen it go through its transition from a, a socialist regime, a market economy, and create the sort of success that it's, it's creating now. But my point is, I wasn't a global citizen then. We are all brought up in an environment where we have no knowledge, and the way we are, we are impacted on the nurture-nature activity of our growth is determined by the surroundings we're in and the people that we interact with. So nobody's born prejudicial, nobody's born not knowing anything. They just, well, they are born not knowing things, but it's how, you, how your influences across that journey happen that determine where you go to in life. So I like to think I've got a global outlook. Um, I'm not perfect. I, I said earlier, and I try and live by this, I have an absolute zero tolerance for discrimination of any sort. And, and I, when I find it, I try and eradicate it, try and get rid of it, try and help people understand differently. That isn't easy. What's happening at the moment in two of the countries that are represented here, which is the UK and the US at least, and it may be others as well, is that we have regimes that are proposing perhaps that the global outlook that we've had for so long may not be appropriate. I have a huge difficulty with that, huge personal difficulty. I'm not going to go into it now, but very happy to be challenged by any of you later. But the insularity that we're getting from the UK government, which for those of you that don't live here, is restricting students to come and study in the UK. I'll come on to that later. And of course, if you're a US citizen, then uh, your own president's concept of uh, restriction of entry is just unbelievable, in my opinion. You have your own opinions and that's fine. So universities have a global perspective. They have a global role. And, and I'm absolutely committed to that. And that means, therefore, that we should be thinking and developing ideas and concepts which we can take out and influence others from, from the work that we do. In terms of, uh, just a little bit of time here on the UK, in terms of, of global, global marketplaces, just mentioning two countries, China and India, they're two of the most uh, highly <coughs> recruited from countries here in the UK. And, and look, at, look at some of the needs here that China has. <laughs> you know, th these, are, these are big numbers. Uh, they're big numbers in both cases. You know, Seven million graduates each year. The UK higher education system has 2.3 million students in it. Okay, and they're not graduating each year, they're graduating every three or four years. So it's only about a third or a quarter of those that go out each year out of 2.3 million. That's the number of graduates per year coming out of China. Look at this number here. I visited the Open University in India a couple of years back. I was astonished, I didn't know, I was astonished to hear that they had four million students in their one university, in that one university. They've got several universities. But one university with four million students. But still, there is a huge need for more graduate opportunities in India. And of course, we can go on and use other countries as examples. I've picked the two biggest countries in the world, done that deliberately. They happen to be the ones that we recruit to here in the UK the most. And the UK and any other developing nation has a responsibility to help, as I often say, to educate the world and ensuring that people that can go to university, who want to go to university, who have the skills to go to university, should be given the chance to do that. In the UK, our numbers are somewhat more modest. Um, so this is the number of non-EU students. The reason why I refer to non-EU and EU is because uh, the UK, for those of you that aren't uh, up to date at the moment, is part of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> we may not be in a couple of years' time. I still hold out that in the same way that Bobby Ewing bo woke up in Dallas, <laughs> having been in a dream for two years, that that's going to happen here. I'm clearly appealing to an age-related audience there with that <laughs> comment. This is a television show many years ago that no longer exists, but... Uh, <coughs> so, yeah, and of course, again, for those of you that don't realise, there was an event in London last week, an award ceremony for higher education, which is held at the same time each year, and it was the anniversary on Thursday last week of the vote taken by the UK population, what I would say is the naive UK population, again, I'm expressing my opinions here, who decided to vote that the UK should leave the EU. 
and, and I'm just going off on a tangent here for a minute. <laughs> Rain me back, Paul. The, the eligible voting population um, in the UK chose uh, not to fully vote for this. 13 million people in the UK who could have voted last year in that referendum didn't vote. 13 million people. 17 million people voted to leave the EU. 16 million people voted to stay in the EU. 13 million people didn't vote. Put those three numbers together and get what you get. Who's Australian here? Wonderful country. Very proud of my country. The question I might ask you is, what, how is voting conducted in Australia? I'll answer the question for the rest of you. How is voting conducted in Australia? It's compulsory. Okay, if you're of voting age, you have to vote. Look at the spoiled votes, it's less than 1%. So I get pretty annoyed to see 13 million people didn't vote. They should have been forced to go and vote. Not just for that, but for every election. Get back off my hobby horse. We were talking about horses yesterday, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just uh, demount the horse. <coughs> there we go, right. I'm off. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, it was you, wasn't it, that had the hobby horse? It, it, was, it was Ruth, okay. <laughs> Great sight, I took a picture of that. So look at the impact that, that higher education on an international stage has just to the UK. And that will be the same in your own countries where you're providing international opportunities for students. And it's not just about money. It, it isn't just about money, but that's one way in which we're often judged. In fact, too often we're judged that way. Second to my seven points was student expe expectations. I love chatting with students. Uh, I love chatting with staff as well. And I wander around the university finding students who I can stop and have a chat with. Even just, just yesterday, um, it happened to be Stuart and some of his colleagues, Connor I saw in the audience somewhere as well, who, who were, are acting as ambassadors this week and helping us out with the conference. And they were gathered in McLean Corridor, just uh, down the back that many of you will be familiar with. And so I stopped and had a chat with them. Uh, found out that a couple of them are graduating the week after next at uh, graduation ceremonies. Some are still in their studies, some have just started. I want to know what students' feelings are and their opinions are of the university education we're providing, how we can make it better. But student ex expectations are changing. UWS is a unique university in many ways. I don't like using that word unique because I think many of us assume unique means that you're fundamentally different. But there are some unique differences here. For example, this university has 16,000 students. 75% of those are mature. In the UK, mature means you're over 21. <coughs> Back to my comment earlier, when I was 30 I wasn't mature. <laughs> but 75% of our students are mature. 25% of them are over 30. So 4,000 of our students are over 30 years of age. Our oldest graduate in the three years I've been here was 75 when he graduated in Hamilton. I think it was the year before last. So what am I saying here? What I'm saying here is student expectations vary and they vary a hell of a lot at this place because we've got people who are young learners who have come through a technologically enabled age when the internet was ever present, where a smartphone was something that they grew up with, to other students who are technophobes. Who, who probably don't make use of a computer or don't use emails. And you know, there was a, a wonderful story last year uh, promoting the fact that Stanford University in America was now advising its students who are seeking entry into the university by using Snapchat. So they get a Snapchat message saying, you're in. <laughs> I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but my point is that we need to be aware that the expectations students have are variable on many, many different forms. And sitting in an auditorium of this sort with a didactic presentation by a crusty old white male pale and stale individual isn't necessarily the way that everybody wants to learn or is going to absorb information. We saw that yesterday as well. Visual learners, auditory learners, doing learners. There are some subjects which do this very, very well. There are some subjects which assume that this is the passage of knowledge. And I have a fundamental concern about that. This was a story, I think it was published earlier this year in, in the Times Higher here, uh, our trade press magazine. This young lad here was what's considered a straight A student. So he'd got pre-university grades that were as good as they could be. And he went to this university and he said, I'm dropping out. And this is a summary of why he said he's dropping out. Basically he said, I'm dropping out because I'm just having stuff thrown at me that I can get off my mobile phone. What's the point of me building up a huge debt for information that my mobile phone or my iPad or something else can tell me when I wanted actually something more than that. Now what I'm doing here is I'm firing a shot across your bows and I don't know most of you. But if we believe that the model of higher education that we're currently delivering, and I'm being stereotypical here, is sustainable for the future, 
We've got our heads up a place where you don't see much daylight. There is absolutely no God-given right for a university to exist forever. And whilst we have universities in this country, St Andrews, it's been around for more than 600 years, does that be, mean they'll be around for another 600 years? And I'm not picking on St Andrews. I don't think it does. We've been here 120 years. Do we have a right to be here for another 120? No, we don't. And if you look at industries that have gone out of business in the past 10 to 20 years, names that were iconic in the world that we've lived and, and grown up with, Kodak, for example, Rover in this country, the, you, you, I'm unsure, whatever country you're in, I'm sure you can name Ansett Airlines for those Australians that were sitting somewhere here. I never thought Ansett could go out of business, but they're no longer there. Look, my point is universities have a role to play they have things that they can do, and they can do it very well. But if we keep doing it the same way, I don't believe we have a success story. And, and this guy is just one, but I'm sure there are other examples of that. So what's going on in that, in that student experience, their expectations? Well, we use VLEs, but I would argue VLEs are out of date. Even what I'm doing today, this PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint was developed in 1989. And yeah, I could use Prezi, that's just another form of PowerPoint. But you know, is this the best way for me to do a presentation to get some information across to you? Probably not. Are you going to hear things today that you haven't heard before that you couldn't read about somewhere else? Almost certainly not. So what am I doing? I'm trying to entertain you. I'm trying to stimulate your thinking, and I'm using this as a vehicle. But VLEs, in my experience, in most universities are underused. And this university is no exception. We use Moodle, and Moodle is not optimised in its form. When you look at a university that delivers distance education, and I don't use the Open University here in the UK as an example of good practice, but I do use the University of Southern Queensland. Any of you work there? The University of Southern Queensland has more kangaroos on site than students. <laughs> it's a distance learning university, and it has an intimate model of interaction with students using a VLE. And so there's a, there's a contract between staff and student. If the student contacts the member of staff through VLE, 48 hours they have to be responded to, within 48 hours regardless of that people being away on leave, ill, dead, or anything else. Now to do that, you've got to have backup systems because we all need a break. Some people do die, or they may be, may be unavailable. So what's the backup system? You've got to have those in place. So there's a variety of things up here on this slide. I'm not going to go through them all. But my point is that we need to be intimate. We need to be forward thinking. We need to be innovative with the way in which we create a learning environment which has a purpose. We've just developed some new graduate attributes here. I'm not going to go into them in, in detail. But as a university, one of the things I'd like to think we're doing is giving somebody more than knowledge. Because as I said before, knowledge for me is not the purpose of university. It was at one stage. For me, knowledge is now a conduit. It's a conduit to creating the learning expectations and the graduate attributes, if you want to use that phrase, that a student will leave university with so that they can become the independent learner, the capable individual to make a huge and significant difference to the society in which they live and work. And that will be some of these things that are up here. It'll be other things as well. But the reason why for me the subject is no longer important is because it's changing. Okay, if I'm doing medieval history, then that's pretty much set in time. But if I'm doing medicine, I want to know when I go to my GP that that GP is up to date with the latest medicines to deal with my complaints. If I get on an aeroplane later today, I want to know that the pilot's up to date with the latest air traffic control requirements and the way in which the plane works, which requires ongoing CPD. Now, if I'd assumed that a, a pilot doing a degree 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is still contemporary, well, that would be wrong. So what skills are we giving these people to make sure they can stay at the forefront of what's important to them and the profession they're in? They're the fundamental things for me that are important. So our graduate attributes, which we've spent a lot of time working on, they're presented in a, a lovely orthogonal grid, and Essen, my, my vice principal down the back there, has been overseeing this. We're very pleased with them, so please have a chat with Essen later if you want to know more about it. This is, this is a... I'm not going to go through all these things here, but there's some important things up here that I just want to draw your attention to uh, when we're talking about student expectations. Uh, I'll, I'll start down here. Um, I've already touched on this one a little bit because in the UK we've got, um, we've got a border control system which is acronymed into UKVI um, that, has, that has created a shift in the way in which students in the UK can come and study here. Uh, it's a bit like a gatekeeper. And, and unfortunately the gatekeeper has been given some rhetorics that I don't like. So um, 
This university, UWS, is ranked in the UK by newspapers who write stories, who create metrics for judging the rankings of the university. We're ranked about 100 out of the 150 I mentioned before. Our Prime Minister says we're a low-ranking university. Our Prime Minister has used language Mickey Mouse degrees, not of us, but low-ranking universities with Mickey Mouse degrees. I get particularly offended by that because we are assessed by the Quality Assurance Agency, which is a, a UK-wide agency that determines the academic credibility, quality and standards of all degree programs in the UK. And we meet those thresholds by some distance, very effectively, in fact. So there's no Mickey Mouse degrees being delivered here. In fact, if I want to talk about Mickey Mouse degrees, Homer Simpson studies, which is now being offered by Glasgow University, is a Mickey Mouse qualification. <laughs> We're not delivering anything like that. So when I hear low-ranking universities and Mickey Mouse degrees get quite annoyed, but last year we were also ranked by the Times Higher, another magazine, newspapers again, but they do a world rankings every year, and we were included for the first time in their world rankings in the, in the range 600 to 800, which places us in the top 5% of universities in the world. So whatever my Prime Minister might think, as far as I'm concerned, we are a 5% top of the world elite university delivering outstanding education to a range of students doing courses across the portfolio we offer. So don't talk to me about nonsense like that and let us recruit where we want to recruit from. But this is a significant one. It comes up again in another slide. Uh, the cost and affordability of, of, um, of university education is certainly under some form of threat. And let me deal with the last one here as well. There was a story earlier this week um, on the BBC referring to an increased level of cheating in universities in Wales. Um, in, the, in the UK, of which there are four nations, uh, higher education is a devolved responsibility. So it means that each of the constituencies, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, look after their own higher education environment. So a study was done in Wales and it found that um, uh, cheating in universities had doubled in the past, I think it was five years. And there's a, there's a couple of follow-up stories worth looking at this sort of stuff because what it's referring to is that we are still assessing in the way that we were five and six hundred years ago. And yet technology has moved on considerably since then. And, and, and I do raise this consistently in, in this university as well. I'm not sure that, a, that an essay is any longer relevant. Now, some of you will defend it and say, well, our professional body requires an essay to be written. But they may do, but they can also be informed about how there are better methods of doing a recognition of achievement and capability. So, so, so for me, you know, knowledge is instant. Assessment has to change. And academic integrity in universities is therefore at risk if we don't do something about these two competing demands, which are having an increasing range of students plagiarising content or using inappropriate sources. Wikipedia dumps, for example. There's other stuff there. You've had a chance to read it. I'm going to move on. Cost and funding. I've touched on this already. There is no one size fits all. You'll all be involved in uh, some uh, regime of understanding around how universities are funded. In Scotland, very quickly, four nations, four different systems. In Scotland, Scottish students don't pay for higher education, so they come here and fees are paid for by the government. They still have to pay for living expenses and for accommodation and so on, but they're not paying for the, f the fee for, for education. In England, for example, at the moment, which is what most people think is UK higher education, in England, students going to a, an English university will pay £9,000 per year for a degree. That's about to go up to 9250 and so they are leaving university with debts of between 50 and 60,000 pounds. Hence my point earlier about that student in America who's dropping out with similar sorts of fees and costs, is this really worth it? And there are different types of studies that have looked at the cost of a university degree now and the recovery that you'll make during your, your career as an earning potential compared to somebody who leaves school at 16. And I've seen two different reports on this, or two different research studies. One which shows that if you leave school at 16 and go into the workforce and work until 65, compared to somebody who doesn't enter the workforce till 22 or 23 because they've gone to university, the accumulated debt and the payoff to that with the income extra that you earn over that period to 65 is a very small differential. I've seen others that suggest the differential here in the UK is between 100 and 400,000 pounds over your career. So I'm not asking for a debate, I'm merely pointing out, it's pretty unclear, we don't know. And I'm not advocating leaving school at 16, though my eldest son did. Um, I'm not advocating university education. I'm saying it's got to be what is right for you. What is right for you, and you isn't the people in this room here, it's whoever you're talking to. 
University is not for everybody, and we shouldn't be promoting it as a panacea for everything. It isn't. Some people should go to university, some people shouldn't. And they should only go to university when they're ready. There is a huge obsession in many countries that education must be a continuum. So you do primary, you do secondary, you do tertiary. But why? Even in my own example, I went back to university at 30 having worked for nine years. Um, I made that choice. People can make these choices. They're sometimes difficult choices to make, but we can make them. So funding is, <laughs> is a, a huge dilemma. I don't have the answer, although I am a strong believer in that the user should pay something toward it. When we know that in the UK, less than 45% of under 30s go to university, I'm not sure why we believe the government should pay for a large, from a large percentage of people that don't go to university for a small percentage of people that do go to university. And so I, I personally believe that a user should pay. I'm not saying they should pay £9,000 or whatever it may be in your country, but I think a contribution means there is greater respect for the value added there being given. And I'm not sure we've got that right just yet. It's not an easy one to resolve. I'm not proposing I've got the answer. Where does technology fit? Does that say 10 past or... Yeah. What have I got? Okay. I don't know whether you can read all those things there. There's a lot of technologies around and that won't be all of them and I'm not going to go through them all. There's lots of different ways in which technology is available to us to make a difference. Um, I might or might not touch on this. I'm sure many of you know about Newton and, and I often compare it to Amazon. So for those of you that use Amazon as your shopping portal, uh, you'll know that if you go on any website, um, anywhere, Amazon's going to probably pop up at the side there saying, have you seen the latest psychology book that you were interested in last week? Or is that tennis racket you were pursuing uh, still something that you want to buy? Well, Newton works the same way, but it's educational content. Uh, and open educational resources are something which we often underestimate the huge range of resources out there that we can have access to. And, and so academics and universities who love to create their own content, you don't really need to do it, you know, honestly. You know, whatever you think you can do that's more creative than somebody else, I can guarantee it's already out there somewhere in the form of an OER. And, and I would suggest you save time and start to use it. This is a bit dated, it's 2008, but it just talks about some of the different things in terms of technology and online learning which are going on. And three questions were asked. Are you using it now? Will you use it within five years? Well, you don't know and you're not applicable. There's another slide I could have put up here as well which says that within five years it's highly likely we will no longer be buying printed books or printed journals because people won't be producing them that way. Well, we're pretty close to that in some areas already. There are some journals you can't get in printed form anymore. You can go and print it off. That defeats the purpose a bit. And I accept the fact that not everybody likes reading something on an electronic device. However, we are reaching a point where electronic devices are going to become more common in the presentation of information. This is a UK body. It's called the Higher Education Policy Institute. And they do some great research here. And this was a piece of work they published earlier this year. Um, on, on uh, data and, and information which exists, and technology which exists in universities from across the world. And they, I'm not going to go through these again, but they found lots of different things going on here um, when, they, when they questioned people in institutions across the world. Uh, reinforcing again that technology and, and the use of uh, modern techniques to deliver learning should be and are more prolific across the system. Their recommendations were this, and this is more UK-based. Um, I'll just have to mention one here. There's an acronym up here, TEF. Uh, we, we had introduced, um, well, in this current academic year, so last September, uh, a framework called the Teaching Excellence Framework. And this was introduced in the English in university system. Um, but unfortunately, whenever something gets introduced in the English institution system, which represents 85% of higher education in the UK, it's very difficult to prevent it from being forced into the other three constituencies. So we often end up finding ourselves having to join or do something uh, as a result of the unintended consequences, or well they may be intended, uh, that the Westminster government has for English higher education. So teaching excellence framework is meant to be a way of judging the quality of teaching in universities. And we saw published last week, for those of you following this in the press, that the 220 institutions who have participated in what's called TEF2, so we're in TEF1, uh, we didn't go into TEF2, and TEF2 rated universities as bronze, silver and gold. And so last week, TEF publication uh, of data for the 220 institutions involved was put out. And it was very interesting to see 
that some of the institutions who would claim to be the best in the UK, and the best of course is a perceptual categorization, uh, but universities in what's called the Russell Group, um, uh, the G8 in Australia, the, the Ivy League in America, uh, whatever it may be in your own country, uh, the Russell Group University uh, set, which is 24 universities, were not all rated gold. There were at least three that got bronze rating, the lowest rating. Now, I can be extremely critical of this framework because I don't believe it judges teaching excellence. It's merely brought together six different points of contact, which are already in the system, and given them a categorization to say you are good at teaching or you're not good at teaching. When I, that's, I'm being rather crude there. Good meaning gold, bad meaning bronze, um, <coughs> and that's not fair. But uh, it's fair to say that, that we have a framework that is not helpful, but nonetheless will appear in league tables undoubtedly within the next year or two as another way of judging how effective UK universities are. So lots of other stuff going on here about how we can use data and technology to improve what we do, and that's the point here. Institutions, and we know exception to this, we've got a huge amount of data and a huge increasing amount of technology in this place that we need to use as effectively as possible for ourselves to make the university better and to enable the learning experience to be more creative and opportunistic. Uh, I'm going to move on a bit quickly because I want to get through to the end point, but uh, just again, technologies. Important not to forget about estates with technologies. This was uh, a library that opened in America last year. It's an entirely bookless library, so nothing in here requires a foundation that goes into the ground 10 metres to hold the stock of books, which are always very heavy. For those of you that don't know much about estates, libraries tend to sink uh, because they're so heavy. Uh, anybody here from the University of Kentucky? Uh, that's good, because your library is sinking. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful building. Beautiful building. It's in the middle of the campus. It's made of marble, but because of the marble and the book stock, the library is actually sinking uh, because of the weight of the book stock. Now, this is not going to have that problem. It's all electronic, and electronics don't weigh very much. So, so this bookless library, I can't recall where it was now. Malcolm's not here to tell me. Uh, but it was opened in America last year, and I, I was, I've raised this with my colleagues a number, number of times. When are we going to be there? And we're building a new campus in Hamilton at the moment, and Paul, who's over there and introduced uh, us all week, um, knows that I'm keen to have as few books and journals in that library as possible. I'm sure we'll have some, but... Uh, uh, and you've seen some of this stuff. This is our big screen downstairs. This is uh, McLean Corridor. We're playing with learning spaces because learning can happen anywhere. Uh, and I can remember working with an FE college, a further education college, uh, many years ago. <laughs> is that me? Sorry. Uh, apologies. <laughs> uh, many years ago in the Midlands, and um, they took learning into the local pubs. They had a huge hospitality and catering uh, program, and so they took learning into the pubs to enable... <laughs> what am I doing? Keep going there, or... <laughs> just <laughs> and my point is that you can learn anywhere, and we, we should take that on board, that... Uh, that it doesn't need to be inside a confined environment like this where you can close the door. And one of the things we're doing on our new Lanarkshire campus is having as many open spaces as possible so that we can be more creative in that form. Um, and again, just historically, I taught in Australia before coming here uh, many years ago, and I worked in an open plan school. It's the most creative learning environment I've ever worked in in my life. And this is back in, uh, back in the 80s. And so we had just really big open areas, and we had classes all the way up there. Every student had an independent learning program. Every student had an independent learning program. So there was no didactic delivery. As a teacher, you were a facilitator, and you went round to the students individually and worked with them, helped them, and then moved on to somebody else. Yeah, that's 30-plus years ago, and yet still I don't see enough of that sort of creative learning happening in environments where we can do it. You can learn anywhere. This is our, this is our new Lanarkshire campus here, by the way, so you're not going to get to see it this time. But next time we hold Hethel... Um, are you choking there? <laughs> Next time we hold Hedl, it, it, it'll almost certainly be held in that environment because it's much, much uh, better than, than this. But you just see some different examples here, uh, Harvard lecture theatres and so on. Staff, let me talk about staff. I'm nearly finished, by the way. Staff are important. Uh, I say quite often because we're on an estate here which was a building project that started back in 1897, 120 years ago, um, and it's still ongoing. And some of the resource space here is not ideal. We've done the best we can with it. But... Um, staff are the most important re resource. We could be, in fact we are, in leaky buildings. I'm sure some of you will experience yesterday walking around that there were some corridors with buckets in. I do apologise for that. Um, uh, it is what it is. We have some flat roofs and they're not easy to uh, preclude water getting in. But it doesn't actually matter if we've got the right staff doing the right thing in the university. 
that supports the entirety of the learning process. And by that, what I mean is not just staff who are involved in teaching students, but also staff involved in professional services, because everybody in the university system is important. So how do you actually get and retain the best talent? Very difficult question to answer at the moment and made more complex by what I referred to before. So we've got 116 European staff working in our university. Uh, one of them is my PA. Many of these people feel quite threatened at the moment that as the UK may leave the EU, still using that May word, the, the dream will happen, I'll wake up soon. Um, as we leave the EU, are they safe to stay here? Is their job going to be uh, sustainable? Will they be allowed to remain in the UK? Now, our Prime Minister announced something early, early well last week I think it was, saying that if you've been here for five years, you'll be allowed to stay. Well, that's, that's good. Is that enough? I don't think so. And so there's lots of outstanding questions at the moment about how you can actually get the best talent into a university because it isn't necessarily just homegrown. I mean, if you look at our staff base, I don't know how many uh, countries are represented. We've got 80 countries represented in our student population. Do you know, Paul? I don't know how many staff we've got from different countries, but I would have thought it's probably 20 or more countries that we have staff recruited from. The best talent isn't always local. Some of it is local. My point is we've got to find ways of getting and retaining the best staff, and that's a number of different things, some of which are mentioned here, will, will actually uh, impact on how that can be possible. I mentioned research here as well, um, and, and research for me is fundamentally important in a university. I, I'm very clear that a university should be adding to the body of knowledge, innovating, and creating learning environments which are useful to the students who come through that university. And, and I take my responsibility with Stuart, who seems to have gone um, very seriously. He is an example of our student body. They've entrusted upon us as a student to come here to get a qualification that they wanted to get for whatever reasons they wanted to get it. So we've got to help them through that learning journey. Now I'm also very clear that they should only be allowed into the university in the first place if we believe they can succeed. I do not believe in letting anybody in who we can't be confident has the skills and ability to succeed on that journey. And that's a conversation. That's a preparation for the hurdles and barriers you're going to come across along the way and making sure we have the capability of dealing with that. And if we don't, then we should say, I don't think we can support you, or you're not quite ready, or we'll help you, but you're not ready to come in yet. Because when they come here, and this is a case, in my opinion, for any university, when they join a university, you are then obligated to help them get out the other end with the qualification they came for. So research, innovation, that learning journey, they are the three crucial parts of a university as far as I'm concerned. People like me, leaders of universities, have a responsibility. This is where we often get it really badly wrong. Um, in my opinion, we've, we've done a lot of this bit here, which is we've improved the system when system improvements have been made known to us. Yet universities actually create knowledge. So why can't we be here innovating what the new knowledge might look like, the new systems may look like, the new ways of working could look like? And I'm not sure we do enough of that. And, and there are sometimes good reasons for that, but I think there are other reasons that are not so good. And we need to actually challenge ourselves and say, how is it we can allow, allow a university to be the best it can be by using all of its capability? And just because I want to, but I know Essen will enjoy the fact that this one's up here, how do we actually make research sustainable? You know, we're a modest research university, but I want research in this university to expand prolifically. We're, we're not a research-led university, but we do some outstanding world-class research here, I can assure you. And hopefully, if you haven't, you might get a chance to hear some about that from colleagues in the next few hours before you leave. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through the list of, of different subject areas, which I could do so, but I'm not going to. But there is some great research going here. But it's not in the mass and volume and size that you might find in a university who has had decades or centuries of research activity and has built up a bigger infrastructure. It's still fundamentally important to us, and we want to see research and innovation going on here to improve the community. Back to the questions. So, nearly there. Yeah, I can see you waving at me. Wrap it up. And so I'm back to the question. So it's nearly over. This is not back to the start. <laughs> so we're back to the future. I'm, I'm not going to stay on that slide, but just have you had your thoughts challenged in that? And then, you know, look, there is no perfect model. We've got an awful lot of universities that have set themselves up in a very similar form, and perhaps we need more diversity in the university system itself, how we run and deliver universities. We're seeing a bit of that, but perhaps not enough of that. And so is the market too filled? I don't know the answer to these questions. I'm not saying it is or it's not. I'm merely posing to you. You, many of you much younger than me, hold the future of what education 
in a higher education institution is going to look like in the coming decades. And it becomes therefore your responsibility, the baton is being passed on, to determine how universities can succeed and be what they need to be. And in my opinion, my caution to you is, they should not be, and they will not be, the way they were in the past. But that's for you to determine. Thank you very much. Okay, I think just to take the opportunity of Craig being on the platform, if we get one or two questions before we break out into comfort break and then into the session, is there any coming questions? Also, Catherine Craig, when he's wandering around. Does anybody know who this principal is? Just, uh, it does say principal term. Just, just note the spelling as well. There, there are two types of principals, one like me, which is not that one, uh, and that's a, a principal, but uh, I'm just going to tell you an aside here. Um, <laughs> is anybody here from the Scottish Government? Okay, good, I'm safe. <laughs> Stop it. No, you're not. Uh, I, I, got a, I got a letter last week, it might have been the week before, uh, from the Scottish Government's um, Education Directorate. And, and it was headed, Dear Principal. Okay, and it came out of the education, <laughs> education department. God. This is, a, this is a scientific principle in forensic science. And what it means is, wherever you go, whatever you do, you personally are going to leave a trace that can be recognised in the future. And I'm not talking about DNA, but of course DNA is one example of that. It's about your impact on other people. All of us leave an impact on other people, no matter how we interact with them. And so that's very precious. As people working in education, what it means is every person you talk to, every person you spend some time with is going to be impacted in some way, some positive, some negative, some ambivalence, from you and your time with them. It's a very, very, very powerful concept. political things such as, oh, such as, for example, the uh, teaching excellence framework, amongst other things. Now, I'm appalled by the teaching excellence framework and the kinds of uh, things that it says it's measuring, which it's not measuring at mm. all. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on, like a university like this, what kind of impact are these kind of sham uh, frameworks going to have in terms of what the students actually think and see? Or do you think that they kind of bypass that sort of sham measurement? It's a really important question. I'm not sure I know the answer specifically to the point you make, but let me just summarise it for those less familiar. The Teaching Excellence Framework has six points of contact. Uh, two of them are associated with, with teaching, uh, and, and they ask questions like, um, you know, were your staff good at teaching or explaining concepts? There are two questions associated with uh, destination data, so did you get a job within six months of leaving the university? And there are two associated with progression data, so did students from one year to the next year progress in a, in a reasonably high level? And, and uh, I'll be very honest here, um, this university has had a poor progression uh, set of data. Um, we're getting much better, but, but you know, three years ago, we were losing 33% of our students who didn't get the qualification they came to. It's down to 17%, still not where I'd like it to be, um, and we're aiming for 7 or 8%. So we've not joined the, te the Teaching Excellence Framework because we know we're bronze rated, and, and I didn't believe bronze was of any particular value to us. Um, I think that the core of the question for me, Lorraine, is do the students in the system feel that you are meeting their needs academically and, and all the other things that they want through that learning journey, and can we, can we demonstrate that in other ways? And I think we can demonstrate that in other ways. So I think and I'm not saying we're perfect and students in here can have a different opinion and there are many students in here. Um, <coughs> I think we're doing things which are showing students we care about them, that we want to provide the best learning journey that we can, that, that their needs are met wherever possible. Um, and Stuart, Stuart, have you gone? I can't see Stuart. Stuart has gone, has he? Oh, he's gone, yeah. I mean, as you saw, Stuart's wheelchair bound. Um, now, we have to make accommodations for him to be able to get into the places in the university he wants to get to. We can do that in most places. We've got some old buildings, we can't do it for everywhere. So there is one room on this campus I can't get him into. But yeah, we, we accommodate him this morning in a way which hopefully does not make him feel 
uh, uncomfortable. And I can use lots of other examples of students in disability or there are nine points of protected characteristics for discrimination in the UK. In nearly all of those nine points I can reference how we're trying to do things to be inclusive and diverse in our support of students. So that's one point that relates specifically to the conference title. We're not perfect at it, uh, absolutely not, but we certainly are recognising of its importance and therefore trying to do things about it. And I think our student population and, and some of them have been here during my journey, which is four years, will have seen things that have changed in that time, which is respectful of them as students trying to get through the process. So I think, on the one hand, TEF is unimportant, but TEF will be used against us. And one of the concerns we have for TEF is that it will almost certainly very soon appear in international recruitment uh, portfolios where people are saying, we're TEF gold. And, and because we're not going to have a TEF rating, they're going to say, oh, well, you haven't got a TEF rating. That means, therefore, your teaching excellence is lower than university with a TEF gold or a TEF silver. That's where the problem lies for us. If you could just, when we finish, um, if you could approach Craig, if you've got individual questions, we can ask the, you can ask the questions there. Is that okay? We're just running tight in terms of being respectful to our colleagues that are running workshops. So... The next element is uh, uh, just grab some coffee. Again, there's coffee, tea and, and water in the rooms. Um, and if we can ask you to be back here for 12.15. So return back to this hall for 12.15. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>